Hi, I'm Tony Northup, and for my photography buying guide, I'd like to answer the very common question, should you use full frame lenses on your crop bodies? And usually this comes about because somebody says, hey, you should always invest in glass before buying a new body. And that advice sounds pretty wise, right? It even sounds a little counterintuitive because a new body is so exciting. But what this advice often leads to is people using expensive full frame lenses on their crop bodies and you're not quite getting what you might expect out of it. So let's explore it a little bit and look at some real measurements from DxO Mark to see exactly what we are getting when we use these combinations. We'll find scenarios where it does make sense and where maybe it doesn't make sense. First, I want to make the point that if you want to determine how a lens is going to behave on a crop sensor body, on an APS-C body, uh, you need to multiply both the aperture and the focal length by the crop factor. Many people only multiply the focal length by the crop factor, and that tells you the field of view, but it doesn't, it, it overstates the capabilities of the lens if you forget to multiply the crop factor by the aperture as well. Here's an example. Uh, I should point out the bottom here URL sdp.io slash crop, where I demonstrate exactly how this works. There are actually three parts to that video series if you really want to get into it, but the first video kind of demonstrates it hands on. Take a full frame 24 to 70 f2.8 lens. This is one of the most common lenses that I see people using on crop bodies. If you put it on a Nikon or Sony APS-C body with a 1.5x crop, it behaves exactly like a 36 to 105 millimeter f4.2 full frame lens would on a full frame body. So you don't get either the, the depth of field, the total light gathered, or the same angle of view. You have to change all of those things. It becomes a very different lens. And I'd like to make the point that the focal length probably isn't as useful. I love using 24 millimeters at the wide end. That's kind of what you need when you're shooting a gathering, if you're with your friends, if you're out, if you're shooting an event. 36 millimeters is pretty tight for that, and you're going to find yourself backing up a lot. So you might find that the adjusted focal lengths themselves aren't that useful. Now, if you have a Canon lens, a Canon body, the APS-C sensor is a little bit smaller. You have to multiply it times 1.6. So it becomes a little more telephoto and that aperture actually becomes a higher f-stop number effectively. Um, another common lens I see people using is the 70-200 f2.8, typically uses a portrait and sports lens. It becomes basically a 100-300 f4.2 on Nikon and Sony or 112-320 f4.5 on Canon bodies. Now let's answer the question, are full frame lenses sharper on crop bodies? This comes up because people notice that the centers of lenses tend to be sharper than the edges. The edges tend to get a little less sharp. So the logic that by using a crop sensor, which uses just the center part of the image circle coming from a lens, that the image itself must be sharper. We can test this and know definitively looking at DxO mark numbers. And I'll show you how to check the sharpness according to DxO mark in just a bit. Uh, let's take a look at the Canon 5D Mark III versus the Canon 7D, both with the original 24-70 f2.8. And I'll tell you why I'm using this particular example. Because I have a friend who's a genius, and he heard that advice about crop bodies being sharper with full-frame lenses, and invested in a very expensive 24-70 f2.8. And he sent it to Canon twice for repairs because he said it, he just wasn't getting sharp results. And this is why. The lens was functioning fine. On a 5D Mark III, it would have given them 14 perceptual megapixels. That's basically how much detail you can see. Uh, and on a Canon 7D, which he was using, it only gives you 7 perceptual megapixels. 7 megapixels. So that's not sharp at all. In fact, he could have gotten better results if he had just used the kit lens. The 18 to 35 millimeter kit lens, which costs about $200, uh, would have given him about 8 perceptual megapixels. That fancy 24 to 70, which costs $1,500, this is the original Mark I, only gave him 7 megapixels <laughs> at 7.5 times the price. So this is why it's really important, because I see people all the time laying out thousands of extra dollars, and then they're being frustrated because they're not getting sharp results, and this is one of the big causes. Just be aware of that. Lenses designed for smaller sensors will give you sharper results, because they're focusing all that light that's coming into the lens onto the sensor itself. When you crop like that, you're also losing detail. It's like doing a digital zoom, basically. Let's take a look at another example. This is the newer 24-70 f2.8, which is a sharper lens on the Canon 7D. It becomes a 38-112 f4.5 with 11 perceptual megapixels. That's doing pretty good on an 18 megapixel sensor. And if you, on the other hand, were to use 
Sigma's 18 to 35 f1.8, you would have gotten 13 perceptual megapixels at between half and one third the price. So a much, much cheaper lens, $800 instead of $2,100, and you're getting sharper results. That Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8, I'll give you a link for it in a bit, is a fantastic lens and it's designed for APS-C cameras. That's why you're not abusing it. It's also giving you a more useful focal length by being 29 to 56 instead of 38 to 112. Now, the zoom distance itself isn't as much. It's one of the drawbacks of that lens. But if you want sharpness, that's the way to go on an APS-C body. Now, let's take a look in the Nikon world at a very similar comparison here. The D610, which has a 24 megapixel full frame sensor with the Nikon 24 to 120 f4. That'll give you about 13 perceptual megapixels. It's not a very sharp lens. I recommend the uh, Sigma 24 to 105 f4 instead. I have that right there. If you match that up instead with the D7100, also has 24 megapixels, but with a 1.5x crop, the whole setup ends up being only nine perceptual megapixels. So you can see you have a substantial drop, uh, almost 50% fewer perceived megapixels, 50% less detail or a third less detail uh, in the D7100 with that same lens because it's designed for full frame and you're just losing all that light that's actually coming in. You're not getting the most out of the lens. Let's compare a full frame setup, the D610 and Nikon 24-70 to an APS-C setup, the D3300 and Sigma 18-35 f1.8. They both gather about the same total light. So in a given environment, you could expect them to have about the same amount of noise. The D3300 with the Sigma has a little less zoom range. The full frame camera is producing only 15 megapixels of detail and the APS-C camera is producing 17 megapixels of detail. Here, because we've carefully matched the lens to the body, chosen APS-C lens for an APS-C body, we actually managed to beat the full frame setup that costs more than twice as much. So are full frame lenses sharper on crop bodies? No, definitely not. Looking at the numbers, it definitely seems like that's not the case. Which pro APS-C lens should, should I buy? And I mentioned a couple times, but the Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8, uh, there's a link to it there. And I want to be clear, uh, I'll get a few pennies if you happen to use my link and I appreciate the support, but I don't have any relationship with Sigma. They've never paid me and I've never accepted any free gear, nor have I from any camera or hardware manufacturer. Uh, I just happen to love that lens. <laughs> Another question, should you use crop bodies for wildlife? Crop bodies have a higher pixel density and therefore they can extract more detail out of the amount of detail that the lens is capable of producing if you have to crop anyway. So the reason this is a wildlife scenario instead of say a portrait scenario is with portraits you can just get closer to your subject and fill the frame. But with wildlife you often cannot fill the frame. So if you're, if you're shooting wildlife and you find that you're always cropping with your full frame body, you might get better and sharper results by attaching a crop body to that full frame glass. This is an exception to the rule that we just discovered about sharpness. So how do you calculate megapixels when cropping a sensor? A question I want to address first. Many people do this incorrectly. Uh, the correct formula is the total number of megapixels divided by the crop factor squared. So if you have a 1.5x crop factor, you square that. So 1.5 times 1.5 is 2.25. And then it's the number of megapixels, like 24, divided by 2.25. Look at a couple of examples. The DA10 has a 36 megapixel sensor. If you put it into its 1.5x crop mode, it produces 16 megapixel images. Um, so by contrast, the D7100, which is an APS-C body and natively 1.5x, is 24 megapixels. So the DA10 has 36 megapixels and the D7100 only has 24 megapixels. But if you have to crop to 1.5x anyway, because you're too far from the subject, well, the D7100 is actually going to give you substantially more detail, 50% more detail. And that's a really big difference that you will notice in your pictures. The 5D Mark III is 22 megapixels. If you have to crop 1.6 times anyway, the final image is only going to be 8.6 megapixels. Now, if you use the new 7D Mark II, which we absolutely love, you're going to be getting 20 megapixels in that same image area. So when you can't get closer to your subject, when you have to crop, you can get a lot more megapixels by using an APS-C body because the pixels are just crammed into a solid, smaller space, taking up just the center part of that lens. Basically, they're cropping for you. Um, now, I'm just talking numbers here, but I back all this up with real-world experimentation. I 
often switch between the 5D Mark III when I can get close enough to birds and the 7D or more recently the 7D Mark II and when I've shot them side by side. You see more detail out of the 7D Mark II most definitely in scenarios when you have to crop. It's always better to get closer to the animals, but we know if you shoot wildlife, you know, you can't always do that. Let's look at some uh, actual real world measurements here from DxO Mark. The Nikon 400mm f2.8, an amazing lens, about the sharpest in the world, with the D810 produces 33 megapixels of detail, which is remarkable considering it's a 36 megapixel lens. It almost never gets that close to the theoretical physical limit. Um, but if you have to crop it 1.5x times, that means it's going to be about 15 perceptual megapixels of detail in your picture. So if you're shooting wildlife and you'd have to crop, that's what you'd get. If you were to attach that same lens to a D610, you'd get uh, only 10 megapixels out of that cropped image. But if you put it on a D7100 body, you'd get 17 megapixels out of it. So here we see the D7100, a much cheaper body, keeps up pretty well with the D810 despite its smaller megapixel count and it completely surpasses the more expensive D610, uh, providing 70% more detail. Uh, in the Canon world, we can see with the mighty big 600mm f4, the 5D Mark III will produce about 20 megapixels of, of detail if you can fill the frame. But if you're cropping 1.6 times anyway, it's only going to give you about 8 perceptual megapixels of detail. Um, the Mighty 1DX, the $6,500 top-end camera, is only going to produce about 7 megapixels of detail with that lens. Put it on the cheapo 70D, Canon's mid-range mid, mid APS-C body, and you get 14 megapixels of detail. <laughs> so yes, in wildlife scenarios where you have to crop, you'll get twice as much detail out of a much cheaper 70D, which, what do they cost, like six or 700 bucks, compared to a 1DX, which costs like $6,000. Um, so these are the kind of decisions that can make a big impact on your photography or your wallet, depending on which way you go. So do crop bodies give more detail when you have to crop anyway? Yes, most definitely. Should you use full-frame lenses on crop bodies? Only for wildlife is kind of what we're determining by looking at these numbers. Whenever possible for regular day-to-day -day shooting, when you can control the distance to the subject and fill the frame, APS-C lenses on APS-C bodies, and if you just want the quality of the higher end lenses, you should probably go ahead and upgrade your body too. Sell your old gear and upgrade everything to full frame or stick with the APS-C lenses. But if you're doing wildlife, put your money into that big lens and use the best APS-C body that you can. So how can you check the sharpness of your lens and body combination? And I'll jump into the browser here and just go to Google real quick and what I usually do is I search for DxO Mark, just the name like that and then the name of the lens. So let's check the uh, Canon 100 to 400. And usually the first result is fine so I'll just click that blindly and what comes up is this lens and then you can see there's a drop list here to tell you uh, which camera that they've tested it with. So let's check out the uh, 5D Mark III, one of my favorite full frame bodies and we'll see that it's giving us 13 perceptual megapixels of detail. We could also switch to the uh, 6D and that gives us only 12 megapixels of detail. They have just about every major camera and lens in there, but I suggest searching for the lens first and then selecting your body from the list. Just to summarize it, use APS-C bodies with APS-C lenses for sharpest results. Use full frame lenses on APS-C bodies with wildlife for sharpest results. And of course, if you want more information, uh, check my photography buying guide, which explores cameras, lenses, flashes, studio lighting, tripods, computer equipment, and just about everything else you can imagine hardware wise in great amounts of detail. It can save you thousands of dollars and improve your results. If you're interested in actual photographic technique, which of course you need to master first before you get too deep into the gear, read stunning digital photography and participate in our online groups. There's over nine hours of video in here and it's helped a lot of people. And if you're interested in the post-processing, the final step in creating stunning images, check out my Lightroom 5 book, which actually has over 12 hours of video training accessible from it. All these, the eBooks are only $9.99. You can get them as a bundle for even cheaper. Just check the link there. Uh, this also has 153 presets. Of course, if you just want free videos from me, uh, just click the subscribe button and click like, and please do share it with your friends. Thanks so much.